Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Trey. Good morning, Randy. Hey, there. hey, good morning, guys. Let's get ready to renew and renovate our minds. You know, God could make a lot of make a lot out of Romans 12 if you give him a chance to. Absolutely. So we want to welcome y'all, welcome y'all to episode four of Renew and Renovate. We're going to continue to pack uh, unpack Romans 12, 1 and 2 this morning, and we're going to specifically focus on what is well-pleasing or acceptable to God. Um, we're going to use Hebrews 13, verses 9 through 19. Um, let's go ahead and hear the word of God and move forward. Hebrews 13, 9 through 19. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of all animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority, because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. We definitely don't want to use that reading. All right, so Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, starts out by saying, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. And I think that that is fundamental to, to offering a sacrifice of our bodies, a, a living a sacrifice, because we want it to be based on the truth and, and to, uh, to be acceptable to God. And it seems that the writer of Hebrews is saying that the way to avoid all kinds of strange teachings is to be strengthened by grace. So, um, what do y'all think? How is that? How are our hearts strengthened by grace? Well, I think um, if you just make a habit of reflecting on grace, on how much you've been given, uh, even though you know your situation is not perfect, it will help you strengthen yourself and say, "Hey, I've, I'm being backed up." If you consider yourself in the army, I'm getting the backup I need. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm getting the support. I'm getting the ammo. And that's the thing you can kind of remind yourself daily. If you can daily have that moment of it's amazing what God has done for me, which you had probably the day you're baptized, you probably had an odd moment throughout your life, but you can kind of induce it on yourself if you want to and have that little moment to power yourself up. And that will help you give that sacrifice that is pleasing because you're going to try to do the best for the person who's already done so much for you. Yeah, and one of the things I'm thinking about this phrase again, our hearts to be strengthened by grace, is in in comparison to, if you will, guilt. I mean, guilt can motivate us. I, I don't think we want to just deny the obvious. Guilt can be a driver in our lives and motivate us. Oh, I did this terrible thing and I've got to make up for it. But grace is strengthening us from the standpoint of look god forgives us completely the he he washes us and makes us clean and we don't have to fear we don't have to worry our relationship with god is rock solid through the death and resurrection of jesus christ our lord and so as we think of this idea of what god has done for us that that should motivate us that should move us that should strengthen our hearts to know that we can come to God, that we can seek him, that he will accept us, and that whatever we do matters to him. It's not done in vain, a too little, too late kind of a mindset. And I also love in this passage in verse 10, where it says we have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. And as we think about the idea that in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, that there were all these sacrifices, and a lot of the sacrifices, only the 
uh, only the priests or their families could share in the, the portion that was designated to the priest. An ordinary person like you and me uh, wouldn't have any right to eat of that, uh, that food from the altar, whereas exclusively again, the priests and their families did. But the writer of Hebrews is saying that you and I, we, as the people of God today, have an altar from which even those people don't have a right to eat. And that altar obviously is the altar, the ultimate altar of God where Christ has offered himself once and for all. And as we uh, share in what God has done for us through Christ, and I think as we think of the Lord's Supper as a weekly reminder of we are eating the body of Christ, the drinking the blood of Christ and the bread and then the blood and this altar of God that we participate in and we share in everything that the body and blood of Christ has accomplished, that there is now no condemnation whatsoever uh, for you and me, that we are completely saved, completely redeemed, completely made new, uh, united to Christ, and all of the blessings that come, again, from his death and resurrection. And that ought to strengthen us every day to get up and say, I love you, Lord, uh, and I want to walk in your ways. I want to know you better, and I want to be light and salt in this world. So there's a lot here that ought to strengthen us, and we can't listen to the evil one who wants to keep whispering in our ears, you're not worthy, you're not good enough, uh, you, who do you think you are kidding, you're a pretender, that we don't listen to him, but we let our hearts be strengthened every day by grace, by God's good, good grace. Oh, ab absolutely. I, for me, um, grace is is used to be pretty one-dimensional. I mean, it was just about this, this thing that I didn't deserve that I've been given. Um, but really when I think about grace, it, 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 it counterbalances my sin. I mean, it, Paul says in, in Romans six that, or five, that where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And here the writer of Hebrews is saying that we can be strengthened through grace. So God is saying that there's a purpose that his grace is to accomplish. One of those is, is it, if we really understand and, and appreciate and uh, lean into the grace of God, we're going to avoid some of the uh, erroneous teachings that the world that, that might be around us or that we might encounter, such as easy believism, where if you just say that you believe in Jesus and um, that you say that you believe that he died for your sins, then you're good to go and you can go about life living however you want to live. And uh, the grace of God doesn't communicate that message whatsoever. The grace of God says that your sin was so serious to God that he sent his son to die on the cross because of it. And uh, as a gift of his grace, you, you have received salvation. So therefore, it should, it should strengthen us. It should encourage us. It should free us from that condemnation, Randy, that you're talking about, mm -hmm. where, uh, yeah, I know I've been forgiven, but there is no I've been forgiven, but for those who have, who have been reborn into to new life in Christ. And not only that, but it also uh, strengthen us, strengthens us I believe in our spiritual walk. I mean, um, as we grow in the grace of God, then we also grow in the extending of grace, the grace of God, uh, which, I mean, I think that fits in very well with, with Paul's call in Romans 12 to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, to be vessels of God's grace, reaching those around us. It's, it's, you know, it's, um, I was talking with someone the other day and maybe it was on our recording I don't think God ever moves in a, and it only accomplishes a single purpose. I think when he moves, when he does something, it's multi-layered and it's, it, it accomplishes numerous things all at once. I mean, he, God's work is, is amazing like that. Um, yeah. Randy got me thinking again about the altar before we move on to the next thing is that, you know, you kind of forget as a kid, I kind of thought when something was sacrificed in the old Testament on an altar, it was just put on a barbecue and then just let to cook until it was gone, right. you know, because you have to kind of get into the deep bits of the Old Testament, really understand those practices. 
but that's not how it was. And it's like, so you think about that, that what was given to God, you know, then nourishes and maintains the priest physically. And so now we don't need, we have, we don't need that tabernacle. So, so what I think he's saying here in light, especially in light of what Randy made clear to me in the context is the things that we're doing, our living sacrifices will nourish ourselves. And that is so true in my life. I know when I do something that I might have balked as, ah, I don't have time for that, or man, I don't. Anyway, when I do go forth and do the right thing and I do sacrifice, it is nourishing to me. I get to have that. I get to have that back in the way in the Old Testament that all your stuff funneled up to the priests and then they got to have it. Now we're all, we have a personal relationship with God. And so when we think about our grace and it inspires us to do things and make our own sacrifices, uh, we're blessed. And if you, I've said this a number of times, if you're going through a hard time, the thing you should really think about doing is helping somebody else. Mm. Because when you're going through a hard time, man, you can, fo- you can focus on yourself. And the reason you're going through a hard time is probably because you can't solve it yourself. Otherwise, you'd have been over it by now. Okay. Now, obviously, you should be reaching out to God for help. But if you take that moment to re- look for someone else who you can help, because they have something going on that you can help them with, you will get to receive that that thing back the gift of that sacrifice comes right back to you and when you live that way you, you know people will reach out to you and your problems can be solved by god's family too of course that requires you to be somewhat transparent if you're going through a problem and you need help but when you have a church family uh you can have those kind of things those kind of helping goes back and forth all the time yeah and i'm thinking of paul's thoughts in galatians 6 about what you reap what you sow Mm. And so to your point, it's like if you're if you're sowing good things, you're gonna reap those things back. You know, what what you give, you will receive. And obviously, God is saying to us over and over again, what you have received from me, give to others, right? And so for us to live in God's grace, uh, I remember I don't know who originally said this statement, but blessed people bless people, right? If you have been blessed, then you bless other people. And so all of these things, I think, are what Romans 12, Hebrews 13, and so much of the gospel is about in terms of what God has done for you. In light of that, God so loved us, First John, over and over again. God so loved us, therefore we ought to love one another. Yeah, my dad used to often say, you can borrow my power drill, but if you leave it outside, you will reap the whirlwind. <laughs> so that's an Old Testament, uh, uh, reap what you sow. Okay. Oh, absolutely. And uh, Trey, what you're talking about really brings attention to to um, verse 15, 16. Do not forget to to do good and share with others. And that's whether it's sharing the grace of God, whether it's sharing the 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 blessings and the resources that God has bestowed upon you. Is that that continual um, giving, which I believe is acceptable to the Lord? It's it's what He intended you to do to be a, a good steward of the things that he's, he's bestowed upon us. So uh, gentlemen, how can we know what is acceptable to God? Oh man. I was thinking about something totally different for those, those passages. And I was thinking about 15 says, praise God with your lips, but don't forget to do good and share. And I was leaning that way, but how do you know what's good and acceptable to God is I think, first of all, just start very simply in this verse. You're doing good and you're sharing. Um, I know there's in the Bible, there's lots and lots of things we could pick out. And hopefully as you grow in your faith, you will become be able to intuit those more as you've heard those commandments over and over again in different contexts. But if that's scary to you or that if, you're, if your brain doesn't work that way, just say, how, who can I share with? Uh, who can I do good to? And... Um, that's like, you know, the, the last thing that every, every kid leaves off the, the Bible verse about the fruit of the spirit, you know, at the very end, it says, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and they stop there. But the verse says, against such things, there is no law. So um, those things, any bit of those fruit of the spirit, if you can act out doing good one of those or act out and sharing, when it says against such things, there is no law, the Bible's not just saying the Arlington City code that has no problem with sharing um it's saying against the law the bible has no law against using those fruits of the spirit so there you go you can you can lean on any one of those what's weird is that we live in a day and age where people sometimes do get arrested for like um giving something to a panhandler Mm -hmm. and i've known people who get 
um, get fines and arrested for um, bringing water to people crossing the border through a desert. They're worried about someone dying of dehydration. And, the, and of course, from a legal point of view, they're saying, well, you're aiding and abetting someone illegally crossing the border. So there you have a moment where, you know, our, the law of the world and the law of God are, are in a weird uh, conflict, at least a perceived conflict. But if you don't know how, what sacrifice is good, I would just keep it simple. Throw a dart at the fruit of the, the spirit um, coloring book page your kid brought home and work on one of those. Yeah, and you know, Jesus tells us, you know, in in his conversations on a couple occasions that all of the law and the prophets are basically hanging on and built upon the foundation of love God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. On another occasion, Jesus will say that uh, the gold, what we call the golden rule, where he says, do to others as you would have them do to you, uh, this sums up the law and the prophets. And so the law and the prophets, and we could say now the teachings of Christ and the apostles in the New Testament are all aiming in the same direction. And they're just trying to point us in the direction of what love looks like. And doing good deeds for the sake of others is love. Uh, refraining from evil that would bring harm and pain into our lives or into the lives of others is love. And so obviously we want to listen to, hear the teachings of Christ and put those things into practice. And the teachings of scripture are a huge blessing to us to help us to see this is the will of God. This is outside of the will of God. We need to avoid that. But the overarching theme in all of it is always love, love one another as God has loved us. And that is holy. That is acceptable to God when we live in the footsteps of Christ, walking in his ways, uh, putting his teachings into practice in every single way. And Jesus is the one who showed us. I mean, he doesn't just tell us this is how you're supposed to live. He showed us this is how you're supposed to live. And I'm, I'm challenged by the story of Jesus in the boat with his disciples when the big storm comes up and you remember all the disciples are freaking out, but Jesus is literally asleep mm -hmm. in this boat that's getting tossed all over the place. And I think that is a good picture for us to see just how uh, Jesus pushed himself. He pushed his body to the limits and he never said no to people when they said uh we need your help and so jesus would literally stay until he was exhausted physically uh driving out demons healing the sick having conversations with people about the kingdom of god answering their questions so much so that here he is in a boat that's being tossed about by a storm he is rock solid lights out asleep because he's exhausted and for us to realize this is who Jesus is, and he wasn't afraid to wear himself out mm -hmm. um, for the sake of others and for us to be willing to do the same thing. Jesus does take time to get away for renewal and rest. We need to do that too. But Jesus, Jesus gave himself uh, in every way beyond the cross for the sake of others. And we need to cultivate that same mindset, that same life, and I think that's what the living sacrifice looks like that mm -hmm. Paul's talking about in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And Jesus did the living sacrifice all through his life, leading up to the point where he gives the sacrifice that is his death on the cross. Oh, absolutely. So <clears throat> coming from the text or using the text as a jump off point, verse 15, it says, through Jesus. And then what I hear y'all saying is exactly that through Jesus, mm -hmm. but let your good works be known. Uh, don't forget good works, get outside of yourself, love others. And the, the verse that I was thinking about was, was a verse where in John, where Jesus says a new commandment that I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. If you want to know what acceptable, what is an acceptable off living, living sacrifice to God, look at how Jesus lived his life as a sacrifice. He, he spoke the truth. Um, uh, uh, he offered the, the, the sacrifice of, of praise, the fruit of his lips. He taught, he prayed, he, uh, he, he 
rebuked when necessary. He, he corrected, he, he, uh, he encouraged, um, you know, he, he exercised that grace, that, that patience, the, 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 uh, you know, you can almost, I can almost hear Jesus at times saying, come on guys, you've been with me all this time and you're still lagging back there, but he was patient with them. And he, he, he strengthened them through grace, through the teaching, through all the things that he's given us. We have God's word, uh, which, you know, if, if I had asked this question to the youth group, someone would have inevitably joyfully yelled the Bible. <laughs> And which is true. Yes, that's how we know what's acceptable to God. But it's more than just knowing what the word says. It's living it out. It's, it's putting it into practice. Um, and uh, Trey mentioned a while ago the word uh, transparent. Um, that absolutely, I mean, bar, going a little further down in, in Romans 12, uh, Paul says, let love be without, without hypocrisy or let le, love be sincere. So uh, obviously it, it would seem to me that, that if, if we're doing it through Jesus, if, if we're loving as he loved, he was sincere. He was not hypocritical. He didn't have two standards. He didn't have that standard for me. And then the standard for all y'all, you know, he, he was, he was sincere in, in his love. He was sincere in what he was doing. Um, he, he honored God at all times with his lips, with his life, with his attitudes, um, and it, so he, it really does boil down to looking at the life of Christ, looking at what he taught, what he said, um, and putting that into practice. Literally, I mean, as cliche as it sounds, it, it's acceptable to follow Christ. Yeah. Um, so what do y'all think the connection uh, going to, to in this passage, but uh, also in Romans 12, where it says, uh, offer yourselves as a, a living sacrifice, holy. What's the connection between holy and acceptable uh, in Romans 12, 1? I'd say it's a matter of motivation. Um, mm -hmm. Your sacrifice is holy if it's without blemish. And you making a cash donation to a charity that you love um, is, a, is acceptable. It's a good thing to do. But there's also, we know people in the world, celebrities or politicians who make um, donations and the purpose is more of the PR, you know, they can, they can really care less about who gets that bottle of water as much as it is that someone sees them giving the bottle of water. And so I would say motivation is very important here. And, uh, when it talks about God sees the heart and, you know, sword separates, you know, soul and spirit, he's the one who knows that. And I, you can fool, you could probably fool every human on earth your entire life. And you're not going to once fool God. And you may do a lot of good for people, but your your what your sacrifice is is maybe not holy, and I you know I think most of the time when we give things we are giving things from a um, an altruistic point of view, but just in this social media age, just check yourself you know before you do some of those things. Now I know it's I'm in a I can also preach the exact opposite of this to you, the social media side is that the reason that I tend to post things online. Um, that are us doing pro-social things. A, I have a, I've usually gathered a group of volunteers around me that I want, I want everyone to see, hey, people are doing this thing, but also you want to inspire your people around you um, to also reach out and do good things. And it'll be good for their heart to do a little donation or something. And so obviously, you, you know, in a social media age, it's, it can be very good and it can be holy to share those things, but it's going to come down again to your motivations. If it's all about that Instagram likes, that's one thing. But if on the flip side, you're using your Instagram likes to make maybe get someone else to donate 20 bucks to Habitat for Humanity or something or your church or whatever thing you're doing, then it can be a good thing. So I'm not sure if I can. I, I'll do a little um, a stealth Googling while Randy's talking, see if I can think. I think there's a verse on the tip of my tongue about your motivations, but I, I may not come up with it. Well, while you're thinking of that, and I'm not trying to steal your thunder, but we need to help you out a little bit. Jesus, obviously, in the Sermon on the Mount, is going to talk about, uh, I believe it's in Matthew 6, that I move into the sermon where don't, don't do what you're doing to be seen of people. Mm -hmm. right? It's like, if you're, when you're giving your alms, don't blow the trumpet. Hey, look at me. Uh, but if that's why you're giving is to be seen by people, then you've got your reward. 
and Jesus is going to say, do it in secret so that your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And so, and that's beside of earlier in the same sermon where he says, you are the light of the world and do your good deeds for people to see them so that they can see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven. Mm -hmm. So we've got some tension there, but it's about to your point, what is your motivation? And yeah. so we'll come back to the question you're asking, Mike, about holy and acceptable or holy and pleasing, depending on what translation you're looking at here. Uh, but the language of holy, first of all, just reminding us here, uh, another word for holy is sacred. Mm -hmm. And the word sacred and holy just simply means that it's, it's set apart and it's holy to God, mm -hmm. it's sacred to God. And I don't know that we use this this language enough in our everyday uh, life mm -hmm. that we really think about what I'm doing, even though I know we, we quote scripture, whatever you do, word and deed, do it all in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. But we don't always really think about, well, when I'm giving uh, an offering to the church, that's sacred. Mm -hmm. This gift, that, that 25 or that $20 bill or that $200 check, whatever it might be for you on any occasion, it's holy to the Lord. It's sacred. Um, and when I do a good deed for my neighbor or at work or for a favorite charity, when I volunteer, whatever I'm doing, or even when I take the time to just be there for a coworker or a neighbor or a member of the body of Christ, it just needs me to, to listen to them and talk with them and commiserate with them over something that's hard going on in life, but that's holy and that's sacred. And, and what we, I think sometimes we don't even notice if we're reading through Hebrews right here, uh, this language in Hebrews is very much the idea of you and me being priests of God. Christ Jesus mm -hmm. is our great high priest. <laughs> and we have such a high priest who meets our needs, one who's holy and set apart from sinners and on, on and on. But, we are called to be uh, now the servants of God, the priests of God. And when we come specifically uh, to chapter 10, and there's this conversation about how Christ Jesus, with his once sacrifice, once and for all, has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And then just a few verses, that's verse 14. And then just a few verses later, we come to that very familiar language of verse 19, that we are to go inside of the Holy of Holies through mm -hmm. the body of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And once we're in there, we're, we, the priests go into the Holy of Holies to serve God, to do holy things. And it, the language there is that you and I are to spur one another on to love and good deeds. It's just another language of holy and pleasing sacrifices to God. And it's in view, again, of God's mercy. It's in view of God's grace that we are now called to be uh, priests, that we have been sprinkled with the blood of Christ, cleansed from all of our sins, so that we are now holy, and we're part of a holy and royal priesthood, and we are to do good deeds. And it all flows out of God's grace. It's not over and against grace. It's not works against grace. It is grace moving forward in our mm -hmm. lives. And Paul uses that language over and over again. I am a, an apostle of Christ by the grace of God. It was a privilege to serve God the way that he did, but it was a grace of God that he was privileged to serve in that way for us every day to live our lives. I, by the grace of God, am a son of God, a daughter of God, a priest of God, and I will serve the Lord today with what he's given to me. And that's, mm -hmm. I really think that's what we want to be thinking about in our lives every day to have that mindset. Mm. Oh, ab absolutely. I, <clears throat> um, for me, I was thinking of the, the old Testament sacrifices. God was very specific in what he was, he, what the parameters he put on what could be sacrificed, what should be sacrificed, what would be acceptable and well-pleasing to him. And Holiness speaks of, of everything that you mentioned, Randy, is, is that that uh, as far as the sacrifices, it was physically pure or perfect. And so that motivation that, that Trey's talking about is vital, is fun, foundational to how we offer ourselves as living sacrifices. Our motives have to be pure, 
have to be right um, without hypocrisy. Uh, so it, not just that, but um, in Malachi, God kind of gets onto the Israelites because they were out offering less than pure, less than acceptable sacrifices. They weren't giving their best. They were given the leftovers. They were given the, the lame, the, the, the ones that weren't really of any value to them. And I, I have a hard time believing that if God, that was unacceptable to God, that, that us giving anything less than our very best to him is acceptable and or and or holy because it's coming from an impure motive it's coming from uh uh you know a a, a blemished uh motive is coming from a, a blemish uh well really just it's not our life that we're offering it's it's the leftovers so um i think about how many times that same concept comes up in the bible i probably i bet you we could brainstorm more but the people you know um, could have thought about the first sacrifice. I can think of as Cain and Abel has that exact same problem. I mean, the first time it discusses sacrifices, it shows one guy brought the goods and one by one, the other brother bought, you know, something here it is. And so that's how, you know, it's holy and pleasing. You, you've taken, you've saved the best for him. You've made it intentional. And I, I think that really is, if you check your heart, I think you, you can, you'll know if you're giving your first fruits or not. Yeah, the first fruits is a is a word we're not again we're not into all these sacrifices of the Old Testament, but we see this language echoed in the New Testament. And first fruits, I think, is especially the challenge for us to think of first, right? And so when they're harvesting their crops back in ancient Israel, the the first part of the harvest was holy, again sacred set apart to God, it was his, it belonged to him, and to have that mindset, and so it wasn't after you get the harvest, if there's something left over after you've gotten what you need, then give that to God, Yeah. but it was, it's the first thing goes to God, and trust him that he is going to provide what's needed in this harvest, trust him to bring you through if it feels less than it was last year, that he's going to provide for you through the coming year to the next harvest season. And for us to trust God that he's going to provide for us when we are generous towards others, when we're generous towards the Lord and, and let, allow there to be a, a very real concept of first fruits in mm -hmm. our lives and the way we give generously for the sake of others. I, I love teaching this lesson to kids about first fruits is that general will find, I'll find a task that has a bit of work in it, but the payoff is so good. It's, it's delicious. Okay. Usually food based because the thing about the people in the ancient lands, you've spent months of time watering and tending, pulling weeds, killing varmints. And the first time you get that, that apple is ready. Oh man, you've put a lot of, that's the one you really want to chomp into, you know? And so with kids, we'll have them usually go through the, a lot of effort of making bread or doing something in, you know, and they, they, I make them do, then they clean up all the stuff and they brings it out of the oven and we get it all out into a thing. And I say, okay, we have, we made a hundred biscuits or something. Let's first take these 10 to the senior saints class and give them to them and let ours just sit here. And so we go in there and bring a little basket to the class, you know, you, and then you, and so you can kind of see like that, that's, you have that moment where you want to be, take that to yourself. Yeah. But I do, I'm telling you when kids do that, they, they have, they, they grown on the way there, but then they're just so happy on the way back because a, you do get to reap the rewards of what you've done at B you had this cool moment and you can have that. If you can make a plan forward to give the first fruits of your paycheck, first fruits of your energy, whatever it is to God. Yeah. yeah awesome. I love the, the, um, the language of first fruits. It, it kind of puts a, uh, uh, a term on what I've been trying to be more active in doing in my life over the last six months year, which is when I wake up in the morning, I, you know, I, 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 I pray, but then I pick up my phone or um, I go to plotting out what I need to get accomplished that day or, or what, <laughs> what task or what, what challenge or, and I've been trying to be a lot more intentional and not just praying, not just 
offering a, a prayer, a quick prayer on, on my way to the bathroom, <laughs> but, but praying and not picking up my phone and looking at anything other than maybe turning the alarm off until I've read scripture, until I've gotten into God's word. So that I'm, I'm, and, and my intention is not just to, um, is to give God my first thoughts of the day. I mean, and to some extent, yes, it is self-serving because I've noticed that when I start my day out with prayer and I make sure that I read scripture before I start looking at email or, or whatever, before I start plotting out my, my day, that I respond to the things that come up in the day. And I'm, I'm a lot more lax. I'm a lot more uh, gracious. The grace of God is a lot more apparent to me and strengthens me as we kind of come back to where we started all because I offered that, that, that fresh part of my day, that first part of my day to the Lord. And, and it really propels me or compels me to say the, this day is yours, Lord. And it, it's, a it, it's kind of altruistic, uh, uh, trying to be, do something unselfish for selfish reasons. <laughs> um, so as we bring this session to a close, I would like to read, uh, the verses 20 and 21 of, of this, um, of what the writer of Hebrews says that, that, uh, is, is really beautiful to me. I, I, I think y'all would, will share my sentiments. It says yeah. now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep equip you with everything good for doing his will May he work in us what is pleasing to him through Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That's great. Yeah. And I'd say my parting shot here is before we give Randy the last word as always is God has armed you. He has equipped you. And if you don't think so, you're just undervaluing your equipment or forgetting where it came from. And so look at your time, look at your resources, your money, your skills, uh, your family, your connections. Those are things you've been equipped with, and God's given them to you so you can put them to use to do good things as a living sacrifice. Yeah, so let me pull a children's ministry teaching moment on us with that. But uh, I think of Moses and while you were talking, and Moses, God's calling Moses, I want you to go, <laughs> go. Yeah. And we've been emphasizing no, grow, and go. And Moses says to God, says to Moses, go and lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses has all these reasons why he shouldn't be the one to go. I can't do it. I'm slow of speech, all this kind of stuff. But ultimately God says, no, Moses, you're going to go. I'm with you and let's go. And Moses is like, well, what do I have? And God says, what's in your hand? And so I think for all of us, it's like, instead of looking at what we don't have, what do we have? What's in your hand? And all that Moses has with that staff in his hand and God did some major stuff <laughs> through the shepherd staff. And God will do incredible things for us just to believe by, and live by faith and not by sight. God has equipped us and God is at work again within us, among us. He God is at work through us, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he will do extraordinary things if we will simply show up and be faithful to his call in our lives to do what he wants us to do and that his grace is sufficient. His mm -hmm. strength is always there and God will do and has for nearly 2000 years done incredible things through the church, through the people of God of every age who have been faithful to say, I will follow Jesus. And if just a cup of water we offer, we don't lose our reward when we're faithful to God and doing the least of these things to the least of God's people, as Jesus says in Matthew 25. Oh, absolutely. That's a beautiful and wonderful way to uh, end. We, we want to remind y'all that if you have questions or comments, please email us. But most of all, we want to end by saying that we pray that your week is well-pleasing to the Lord, that, that you are strengthened by the grace of God, and that, that uh, through Christ, we offer ourselves this week as living sacrifices. I love y'all. Okay. See you next Let's week. Get, Let's get back to work. Get back on the job side, people. Amen. Let's do it. Amen.